Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another edition of OD Wire's webinar series. And tonight we have got a fun one for you. You know, if I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me to do a webinar about a difficult topic, you know, a topic that's not just the same old, same old, I'd, I'd be a very rich man. So tonight we're actually very fortunate um, in that we're going to have a show all about Ultra Health, which is the newest hybrid contact lens, uh, which you can use for some of your more difficult fits. And before I introduce our speaker, let me just sort of uh, go over the ground rules for everyone tonight. Um, if you have a question, you'll see on the right side of your screen a big box that says Q&A. Type your question on in there, and, uh, and what we'll do is uh, um, everyone will sort of ask questions, and then at the very end, we'll pass them on to our speaker, and we'll verbally ask the questions and do a Q&A that way. Um, and so with that said, why don't I introduce our speaker uh, for tonight's show and tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Jeffrey Sonsino from Vanderbilt Eye Institute. Um, and Jeff's uh, specialty is actually in difficult to fit or complex contact lens cases. Um, and so this, this is what he does best. And I can't think of a better person to actually talk to us tonight uh, about this new lens. So with that said, Jeff, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Adam. And thank you for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to be here with you talking about this topic. It's right in my wheelhouse. For the past 11 years, I've been at Vanderbilt Eye Institute, but I'm actually leaving in one month for private practice. I'll be joining my wife in practice, and we're hoping to create the region's largest irregular cornea practice. And so the majority of my practice now is irregular corneas, including keratoconus, post-surgical, and post-trauma. Just by way of disclosures, uh, I'm a consultant for Synergize. Uh, I'm a consultant for Alcon. I'm a principal in a low vision company. I'm a fellow in the Scleral Lens Education Society. And I'm on the advisory board of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute. So you can see that I have loyalties to each of the modalities that we will be discussing. So there's no doubt that I will be offending somebody tonight. The story of the consulting arrangement with Synergize is interesting, and it pertains to this talk, so I'll, I'll just mention it to you. Up until 2011, around 95% of my keratoconus practice was GP lenses and piggybacks. In 2011, I started a dedicated scleral lens clinic. The percentage of keratocones fit with gas perms dropped to about 90%. We still fit only the most advanced cones and sclerals. It was about that time that I started experimenting with clear cone, which was the generation one of a keratoconic lens by Synergize. It sounded like a great idea. I had my challenges with that lens, uh, having the familiar tight lens syndromes. But for some patients who did well in the lens, it was a game changer. So in 2012, when Ultra Health came out on the scene, I decided to give it a try. It turned out to be a completely different lens. My successful cases kept growing and growing, and soon I became the most prolific fitter of the lens in the country. Now, I've since lost that title to larger practices with multi-doctor, um, but I continue to fit around three to four hybrid lenses a day. So my keratoconic practice shifted to around 45% gas perms and piggybacks, 45% ultra health, 5% scleral, and 5% other. Synergize then asked me to consult, mostly teaching other doctors how to make hybrids work in their practices. And incidentally, I'll tell you that they also have what is probably the best multifocal lens that I've seen that has not hit market yet, but it will in March. So stay tuned for that lens. But today we're going to focus on the Ultra Health lens. And so what we're going to talk about is just an overview of what the lens is and what it does. We're going to talk about benefits of hybrid designs in general. We're going to talk about some of the challenges of gas perms and gas perm piggybacks. And then we're going to look at ultra health versus scleral lenses, um, some of the challenges of sclerals, and also the appropriate uses for sclerals. And then I have some real neat cases that we'll go over and we'll, we'll talk about. Now, this, you know, because it's a, a webinar, it's not going to be incredibly interactive. But what I hope is that, uh, you know, I see a lot of familiar names on the list of who's signed up. So I'm really hoping that you guys will come up with some good questions, and we're going to save plenty of time uh, afterwards for Q&A. 
And really, I want to make that uh, nice and interactive. So first, an overview of the Ultra Health Lens. It has an aspheric reverse geometry gas perm center um, with a soft silicone hydrogel skirt. Now, with reverse geometry, the vaulting system that lifts the base curve of the lens above the corneal surface, it has an optical zone that is designed to vault that central cornea, which in turn allows you to follow the rules set by CLEC, the CLEC study, the Collaborative Longitudinal Evaluation of Keratoconus. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, this is the landmark study that optometry owns. We, you know, we, we set this up. It's a multi-center um, uh, retrospective review study that really established the standards of care for keratoconus. And one of the principles that they talk about in this study is the FDACL lens. It's F-D-A-C-L. And the FDACL lens stands for the first definite apical clearance lens. It was found to be the optimal lens fit for keratocones, hands down. There's nothing safer and there's nothing better in terms of vision. Here are some images from the original uh, Edrington paper on, uh, it, it, it was one of the original CLEC papers. Um, the top picture you can see uh, that central bearing in the middle of the gas perm. Uh, this is a flat-fitting uh, gas permeable lens. In the middle picture, we have the traditional three-point touch. And so you can see in the very center of that lens, there's a little bit of clearance of that fluorescein right over the tip of the cone. And the goal of a three-point touch, as most of you know, is to kind of spread the weight and the bearing of the contact lens on the cornea between the central cone and the mid-periphery, which, let's see here, I got an arrow, um, which is the dark part all around, okay? On the bottom, we have a, uh, a, a, a standard uh, apical clearance lens. And so you can see the majority of this lens, there's green fluorescein all around, meaning that the lens is completely vaulting the cone. Now, although CLEC could not establish a causal relationship, 32% of eyes with flat-fitting lenses develop scarring by the eighth year, whereas only 14% of eyes fitted with apical clearance lens designs developed scarring. And that's pretty striking. The reason that a causal relationship could not be established is that this was not a prospective multi-center randomized clinical trial. And so in order to establish a real strong causality, it would be a, a, a major new study. So let's get back to the ultra health lens. You know, we're, we're vaulting the central cornea. Where's my arrow? Here it is. We're vaulting the central cornea with the use of this gas perm. And one major difference between the clear cone and the ultra health is that the silicone hydrogel skirt, which starts right here, does not lift and sustain the gas perm off of the cornea. This gas perm region is set up differently. The four skirt curves that are available, they aid in the centration and the comfort. And one of the clinical pearls that I'll drop with you today is that nearly all the fits that I see in the ultra health lens are of the flat curve. So it comes in flat two, flat, medium, and steep but rarely do I have to use these other curvatures. And this is clearly different from the clear cone fit. With the clear cone fit, we used the soft portion to vault the gas permeable portion off of the cornea. And so what we found is that we were fitting steeper and steeper and steeper skirts. And every time we fit those steep, steep skirts, we were cutting off the oxygen supply to the cornea and we were causing tight lens syndromes. And so I guess the, the take home from this slide is that the ultra health lens is designed completely different than the clear cone. And we're going to get into that now. So here in this slide, we have anterior segment OCT images of the, of the ultra health lens, which is in the top left, and the clear cone lens, which is in the bottom right. And what we're looking at is the junction between the hard portion, which is here, and the soft portion, which is here. And so what you'll notice about the ultra health versus the 
clear cone is that the ultra health has a much flatter and broader inner landing zone. And so this inner landing zone is really where the gas permeable portion of the lens comes in contact with the cornea. Um, the outer landing zone is this soft portion. And what you can see is that it's a very meaty and thick area. I'm getting a message that somebody can't see the arrow. Adam, can you see the arrow that I'm pointing to, that I'm using? Uh, I can see the arrow. Uh, I'm getting a couple other messages that they can't see the arrow. So, uh -huh. ah, can't see it on, can't iPad. See it on the iPad. OK. All right, is so there any other means can, of pointing? Some people can't. Oh, you know what? Let me try drawing. <laughs> Let me try drawing and see if I can draw on this. OK. You people on the iPad, can you see that? Well, that's interesting. OK. Anyway, moving on. Um, so this outer landing zone in the ultra health here uh, is a very fat portion that comes in contact with the cornea. And it cushions against the cornea. And that's very important, and we're going to get into that in a couple slides. You contrast that with the clear cone down here. Oh, no, it messed it up. Here we go. Contrast that with the clear cone, where you can see there's a shorter and steeper inner landing zone. Remember, this is the gas por permeable portion. And we have no outer landing zone. And so essentially, it's just a, a flat uh, topography to the inside of the soft skirt. Now, one of the most important advances of the Ultra Health is the new skirt design. Having a high DK silicone hydrogel skirt along with the outer landing zone has eliminated most cases of tight lens syndrome that we saw in the clear cone. Together with the hyper DK gas perm core, look, it has 130 DK, whereas the skirt has 84 DK. Um, it also allows me to feel more comfortable fitting eyes like this. Where's my arrow? Here we go. Eyes like this, you know, with severe underlying vascularization. Because these patients have relatively few options when it comes to contact lenses. So I want to get a lens on them that lets the absolute most oxygen through. So who will benefit from the Ultra Health? This lens was designed primarily for keratoconus. It accommodates mild, moderate, and severe cases. It's also good for ectasias, um, such as post-LASIK ectasia and pellucid. Now, when it comes to pellucid, I've been successful mostly with early pellucid. The more advanced pellucid cases typically will require large diameter gas permeable lenses, such as semi-scleral and scleral. Um, it works for post-surgical cases. It works for post-corneal cross-linking cases. And they often have the most stunning success. Um, we're not a site that is doing the clinical trials on cross-linking, but we collect these patients from elsewhere in the country. And I'll tell you that they are some of the most stunning successes because their corneas are more rigid than most corneas because of the procedure itself. And so when you couple that with a gas perm lens on top, you know, these patients are happy as clams. 2020 vision is the norm. Um, and then they work for other corneal irregularities, such as central scars. Um, when we're fitting the lens, we always trial fit the ultra health lens. You know, this is not a lens that you can empirically order. We want to put that lens on and see what it looks like with fluorescein. And we always start with a 250 volt. Uh, lens, trial lens, for mild to moderate cones. And we start with a 350 micron vault for advanced cones. And these are cones with Ks 48 diopters and above. Now that breaks with the standard fitting protocol, but eyes with Munson sign, you don't even have to bother with a 250 volt lens. You know you're going to be fitting them with higher amounts of vault. Okay, Adam, um, this is one of the videos. And we're doing video for the first time tonight, so let's hope that this works. Um, <laughs> Jeff is very brave. So we're going to do preparation? Yeah, this is preparation. Or insertion? This is preparation. preparation. So here we go, everyone. So preparation. Let's see if we can get this right. 
Okay, hopefully everyone can see what's on the screen and I'm going to start it. All right, it doesn't sound like there's audio coming through, so I will talk about this. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the lens in um, an inserter. I'm filling it up with non-preserved saline. Okay, and you don't have to fill the bowl all the way. Um, a little bit, leaving a little bit at the top is actually beneficial because then you can actually get the lens closer to the eye without the little meniscus of the bowl causing the eye to blink. So then I'm just taking normal uh, molecular weight fluorescein. You don't have to use high molecular weight fluorescein with these lenses because, um, because it is uh, a silicon hydrogel skirt. So Adam, you can flip back to the talk. And a silicon hydrogel skirt is not going to take up normal molecular weight fluorescein. Um, and you know, for the, the reason I mentioned that is because with previous generations of synergized lenses, you had to use that uh, high molecular weight fluorescein because it was a hydrogel uh, soft part. OK. So next, you observe the trial lens on the eye. And here, you can actually see some central bearing. And so you, you look at this image, and here we have the evacuation of fluorescein right in this central portion, and it leaves a dark area. Now, one of the clinical pearls that I'll leave you with also is you get a much better visualization with a ratin filter. Um, you can notice this central bearing much easier. And it's hard to appreciate in uh, anterior segment photography. But when you're sitting behind that slit lamp, I will tell you that it is a very striking difference. You cannot see central bearing as readily with just a cobalt blue filter as you can with the Rattan filter, which is probably why Synergize includes that in all of the trial lens sets. So we have this central bearing. Um, we don't want central bearing in this lens. So we put on a lens that's steeper. And now we have just this little bit of feather touch. Okay? And if you're familiar with fitting gas perms on keratocones, you'll, you'll, you'll typically want to get about this to get a three-point touch, that three-point touch fitting philosophy. In a hybrid lens, this is bad. And the reason this is bad is because we know that there will be around 50 microns of settle over the course of wear. And so this lens is going to come 50 microns closer to the cornea. And if you start out with this amount of bearing when that, lens is in, or when that patient is in the chair, then you know that later on the, in the day you're going to have much more bearing than this. So the next question is, well, how much, you know, what should the fluorescein pattern look like? This is an optimal fit. So I want everyone to kind of burn this into their brain as to what they're looking for. And we're going to go through this and kind of dissect this fit. Um, what we have is 100 microns, or what we want is 100 microns vaulting the cone. And so essentially what you're going to notice about the, the central fit of this lens is nothing. You're going to just see an even green um, background in, in the central gas permeable portion. Um, there's no darkening of the, the sodium fluorescein. It's all even. Now, as we move further out into the periphery, we see this dark area. Okay, and this is exactly what we want, because this is slight inner landing zone bearing. And you remember back from that OCT image, this is where the gas permeable portion is gently coming into contact with the cornea and spreading uh, partial weight of the lens as it rests against the cornea. As we move further out to the periphery, we see the edge lift of the gas permeable portion, which again is what, we, what we're after. And then as we move more periphery, now we've moved from past the junction. So the junction of the gas permeable portion and the soft portion is right here. And we want this outer landing zone bearing, because this is where that soft portion is actually taking up the, the, the bulk of the weight of the lens against the eye. And so you know, the, kind of the take home is that we have truly no bearing on the cone which is a true FIDACL contact lens fit. Here is an anterior segment OCT image of 
you know, what we're seeing, but just in profile. And so here we have the front uh, surface of the lens. Here we have the back surface of the lens and the front surface of the cornea. And what we notice is that there's this nice area of vaulting right over the cone, OK? And then as we move towards the periphery, you see the inner landing zone coming much closer to the eye. And in this case, it's actually contacting here, which is what we want. Then we have this little bit of edge lift to the gas permeable portion. We have the junction right here, OK? And then we have this fat belly of the silicone hydrogel skirt, again, which is exactly the, the, the benefit of the redesign of the Ultra Health. It has this fat area that cushions against the cornea. Now, this image is courtesy of uh, some of our European colleagues. And I had to throw this next one in there because it is just such a striking image. Uh, here we have a very advanced cone. And you can actually see scarring in the tip of the cone. Okay. Um, we have a higher vault lens. So the lenses that are 300 microns and above are actually designed a little bit differently. They have a more pronounced vaulting curve. And so you can see kind of the chine of this curvature is much more severe than it was in uh, the previous lens. And what that results in is greater reverse geometry and greater vaulting over the central cornea, which is why this lens works so well um, which is why this lens works so well with more advanced cones. And then you can see this fat belly of the silicon hydrogel skirt. So I love that picture. All right, so what are some benefits of the hybrid design? Uh, centration is the biggie. So you know, everyone who fits gas permeable lenses knows that you know, a, a, a gas permeable lens alone is going to center over the steepest portion of the cornea which is the cone. And now this area is not necessarily in the center, and frequently it's not in the center of the visual axis. And so you know, these lenses, gas permeable lenses, are typically centering over uh, an inferonasal or inferotemporal zone. Um, the, the, the skirt that's in the hybrid lens um, will grab onto the good, normal peripheral cornea and really center the lens. Now, you might use different skirt curves to center the gas perm, but in general, um, most of these lenses are going to center very, very well. They stay very stable because of that soft skirt. Um, the, the thing that patients comment on the most is the comfort. That is by far, in a way, the, the, the benefit that they see the most in an ultra-health lens. When you take that patient from uh, a gas perm lens and put them directly into an ultra-health, it, it is life-altering for them. You know, suddenly, if they're in a dusty environment, they don't have to rip off their gas perm immediately when they get dust underneath um, because the soft portion protects against that. Um, optics are great because it's a gas perm in general. And now we can truly fit with a fidacal contact lens, which is extremely important for health. You know, our job as optometrists is to fit a lens that is going to work for them, but also be the healthiest lens and try to prevent scarring and some other nasty things that we know can happen. Other benefits of the hybrid design, we can typically obtain optimal fits in two to three visits, which is pretty darn good when it comes to keratoconic fitting. Um, I'll tell you, I already mentioned that 85% of the fits are with the flat skirt. And you know, when I'm doing these follow-up visits, I'm mostly modifying the vault and the power. Infrequently, I need to modify the skirt curve. I will use steeper skirt curves uh, for three reasons. One, for better inner landing zone and outer landing zone profiles. And so if you put that lens on and you don't have that perfect um, sodium fluorescein image that I showed you earlier, um, you want to try to achieve that by changing the skirt curve. Okay? The second reason to use it is when there's edge fluting. So if you have a lens that has a skirt curve that is too flat, you're actually going to see a pucker of that lens off in the periphery. And typically, it's either uh, infronasal or infrotemporal. And the patient may feel that. Now, I, I will tell you, one of the pearls is that if you put that lens in and you see a pucker immediately, give it a few minutes. Because typically, the soft portion 
will adhere better once there's tear exchange into the matrix of the lens. And the third reason is to improve comfort. And so if you start with a flat skirt curve and the patient is uncomfortable for some reason, typically it's because of skirt curve and you, can, and you may not see anything. You, you may see that it looks perfectly fine. But if they're complaining of comfort, the next thing to do is to make it a medium skirt curve. So steepen it up just a little bit. Let's talk about some challenges of gas perms and gas perm piggybacks. Comfort is always difficult with gas perms. Keratocones habituate to their gas permeable lenses, but they never describe lenses as truly comfortable. So then we add a piggyback, right? But then what happens to convenience? Suddenly that patient is putting in four lenses. Uh, what happens to cost? Suddenly, you know, the cost doubles or triples because they have to replace that soft lens. And then there's the question of what is the actual DK over T? Um, there is good work in the scleral lens literature that shows that once you increase the vault and, and you put a huge post-lens tear reservoir behind that scleral lens, that huge area actually acts as a resistor to oxygen flowing to the cornea. So the increased space that's taken up with tears is actually decreasing the amount of oxygen coming through. There are fit issues with gas perms, and then there are complications. And every single person in this, uh, in this conference has seen giant papillary conjunctivitis because of gas permeable lens edges, hard edges, that are really acting like sandpaper on the, the, the papillary conjunct conjunctiva. Well, let, let's talk about some challenges of sclerals. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, I have a big dog in the fight with, with sclerals. I, I have a, a massive scleral lens clinic, and, you know, I, I do some stuff on, on the national level for sclerals. But they do have their challenges. The national average for visits in order to get a scleral lens that a patient takes home is between six to eight visits. Uh, for that reason, they are more challenging to fit, and they are more expensive to the patient. There's no method for assessing the topography of the sclera. And with a rigid haptic, instead of a, a, a silicon hydrogel uh, edge to it, the scleral shape must be precise. Ideally, the lens should rest on the conjunctiva with neither edge lift nor compression of the conjunctival vasculature. And so this is an image of a, an ideal fit uh, haptic of a scleral lens. And what you can see is the blood vessels, the microvasculature of the conjunctiva, flow perfectly outside of the lens and inside of the lens. Okay, so there's no deviation, there's no compression of these blood vessels, which means that we're aligning with, with the shape of the sclera perfectly. That's when it works out. Um, I mentioned that there's currently no way to, as to assess scleral shape. Now, that may be changing. F. Vanderwarp is currently working on topographical analysis of the sclera. And you can see that he actually maps out further past the limbus. You know, the only question here is going to be, I have so much equipment in my office to try to do, you know, so many different things. If this is going to be another $30,000 piece of equipment that I need to map the sclera, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to buy that piece of equipment. So if these guys can put it into, you know, a current topographer or make it, you know, an, an add-on that we can put on, then maybe it's a viable option. And likewise, Chris Sint in Iowa uh, will be launching a company to do scleral lens molding, uh, like the, the original sclerals, only with computer modeling of the mold for more accurate production of the lens. But currently, there is no way to model the shape of the sclera. Um, irregularity of the sclera may be even more pronounced in those who have undergone ocular surgery, like RK or scleral buckers or PK. Here is an image of somebody with a limbal relaxation incision that is almost right on the limbus. And so this served to really flatten, flatten the scleral shape here. And this was a bear to fit with sclerals. Uh, this is an example of an improper lens haptic of a scleral lens. And what we can see here is that there's sectoral impingement 
at 3 o'clock, you can see the blood vessel kind of dives down and it gets compressed. And all of the microvasculature is essentially whited out because of that compression. But if you look real closely at 7.30, we also see edge lift. All right, so we have edge lift in one portion, and we have compression in the other. What's the answer? Oh, I heard it. No, not really, because nobody has audio. But here it is. Um, it became quite clear that most sclera have a toric shape. Uh, and so the newer design scleral lenses are made with toric haptics. And here's an example of a toric haptic. Toric haptics have uh, rotational markers similar to toric soft contact lenses. So you can tell exactly where the lens is centering and where it is aligning. And um, it, it's pretty remarkable in terms of how these things find their position immediately. However, there are still problems with toric haptics. Here are superior, infer, inferior, nasal, and temporal gaze images of a patient wearing a toric haptic scleral lens. You know, still the problem that we have is that we don't know how much toricity there is to the sclera. Um, it's a mystery. And, you know, varying the amount of toricity still may not fix the impingement. Another problem is scleral decentration. Um, we have an anterior segment OCT image, and the front surface of the scleral lens is cut off here, but you can kind of see it as it moves off here. The back surface of the scleral lens is here, and you can notice that here we're coming in contact with the cornea, whereas over here we have a ton of vault over the cornea. Right? And the problem is that as the patient looks through their visual axis, we have essentially what is created is a prism. And so vision is poor, but also, and more importantly, comfort is poor, because this edge is rubbing right on the cornea. Fixes for this include increasing the overall diameter, increasing the optic zone diameter, or flattening intermediate curves to force the lens to center. You know, one, one of the other challenges of sclerals is when is it appropriate to use them? It's hard for me to justify the additional cost of scleral lens evaluation in an early to moderate case of really anything, any irregular astigmatism. Um, and so in my clinic, we reserve, we, we reserve sclerals for really the most advanced cases. And you know, I, I feel like patients need choices. And so when patients come to see me with, with an irregular cornea, I essentially give them a menu. And I say, here are our three options. We can use gas permeable lenses, we can use hybrid lenses, or we can use scleral lenses. And then I go through the pros and cons with, for all of them. And I can tell you that when it's presented kind of logically like that, most patients nowadays are choosing hybrid lenses because they balance everything. It gives you the pros of the gas perm, but it doesn't give you the cost of the scleral lens. Other challenges of sclerals, and this is probably the biggie, um, limited tear exchange. So we know that uh, a scleral lens will essentially trap everything in that post-lens tear reservoir that it accumulates through the day. The, the cornea is a living, breathing beast, and it is constantly metabolizing oxygen and spitting out waste products. Where do all those waste products go? They go right in that post-lens tear reservoir, and they stay there. Rob Brees was the inventor of the, the modern-day uh, scleral lens. He invented Jupiter contact lenses, and he called this environment the toxic swamp. I love that, 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 that analogy because it's true. Whatever ends up in that area stays there. And so many patients have the need for intraday replacement. They have to take off lenses and put them on throughout the day. And insertion and removal of scleral lenses is not easy. It has to be used with tools. You cannot use your finger to take off a scleral lens. All right, Adam, I'm going to call you back here. Um, we're going to start the video that says scleral lens insertion. 
And I'll apologize right off the bat. This is my weakest of the three videos. And my technician who was taking the video um, was not in the right position for this. But I wanted to show it because I want you to see uh, the ease of inserting the lens. And so I have the patient. Let's see if we can get this to start. Just look straight down there. Is it playing for anybody? Um, so the idea is I have the patient look straight down. They bend their head all the way over. Remember, we've already filled the bowl with um, non-preserved saline, and we've put a little bit of fluorescein in there. And uh, let's see if I can get back on here. Um, Let's, let's see if we can do the second video without crashing this, because the second video is even better. The second video is actually me removing a lens. OK, here we go. An ultra health lens. I'll have the patient look straight. I'm sorry, chin straight. All right, look sweet. All the way it's working. Up. All right, so I have the patient look straight up uh, with their chin straight ahead, but look all the way up. And the idea the is portion, you pinch the, the soft skirt right portion and it breaks the suction of the lens, and it pops right off. So removal of these lenses is simple, and you don't need tools to do it. With proper technique, this becomes incredibly routine. Uh, the pearl I'll give you here is that when you're removing lenses or when the patient is removing lenses, the hand, the fingers, must be perfectly dry. If you go in and you try to remove that lens and you slip off of the, the, the soft skirt because it's, you know, it's silicone hydrogel, it's slick, don't even try to go back in for a second time and pinch that lens off without drying your hands. It won't work. But if you dry your hands, it will come right off every time. All right, let's talk about some cases. Um, this is a patient sent to the scleral lens clinic by an outside ophthalmologist. He had a scleral patch graft from a conjunctival tumor, and he had that excised. Um, he needed a lens that would provide bandage coverage to the graft, but would also improve irregular astigmatism. There was no way that a scleral lens would be indicated here, but the patient had this on his mind, so I put one on. Sometimes it's better not to talk people out of things without showing them. As soon as the gaze shifted, air was injected into the post-lens tear reservoir. Again, there was no way that a scleral lens was going to work on such an elevated periphery. So next, we inserted a hybrid lens, 20-25 uh, vision with complete comfort. You can see the gas perm portion of the lens fitting nicely inside the elevated conch. So this was a home run for this patient. Here's a patient with, who has post-intrastromal rings, or intacts. You can see the intact segment here. Okay? And we can actually see, if you look real closely, the edge of the gas perm portion of the hybrid lens. Right? And then, of course, you see the edge of the silicone hydrogel skirt. And sometimes, in cases where the intrastromal ring is placed deep and there's not a huge amount of elevation, you can fit this right in, and you can see my fluorescein picture here, which I broke my rule. I'm not using the Rattan filter to evaluate this one. But you can see that there's no real bearing over this area. And that's going to be key. If you see bearing above the intra intracorneal ring, it, it's a non-starter. And so you'll have to use a higher level of vault, because you cannot have that bearing. So in conclusion, um, as fitters of irregular corneas, you need many designs in your tool chest. Um, in my opinion, the Ultra Health is a serious contender for keratoconus and for irregular corneas. I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this lens, and it kind of astounds me why other practitioners aren't adopting it. With the success rates that I'm seeing, uh, it, you know, it's something that you have to be able to at least offer your patients. You know, it's like anything else. Once you get comfortable with any kind of modality, it becomes second nature. I mean, I'm so comfortable with this lens now that I can put this on, and within you know, two trial lenses, we're there. And so my chair time has you know, remarkably uh, de decreased. So at this point, 
uh, let's open it up for questions. You know, I see there's there's a lot of uh, questions in the message board. And Adam, if you want to moderate this, we can uh, we can tackle some of them. Sure. Well, well, thanks so much, Jeff. Yeah, we have about a million questions here. You know, we have a big crowd tonight, and everyone's really interested to hear what you had to say. So. I guess, why don't we do this chronologically, if that sounds like a, a good thing to do, um, <laughs> and just sort of work our way down the list. Um, so let's see. Uh, question here, just a clinical question. Can you describe some of the findings in tight lens syndrome? So tight lens syndrome, um, this is no mystery at all. I mean, this patient is going to be knocking on your door at 7.55 before you open the office with a red eye. And so I'm not sure that there's many findings other than, you know, the patient will come in screaming that their eye is red and they can't see. And so you take that lens off and you may notice, um, uh, you may notice corneal edema. You're definitely going to notice conjunctival injection. Um, they could have epithelial defects. Um, you know, essentially, you know, you're looking for the typical uh, Claire, contact lens associated red eye that you get in, you know, any tight fitting lens. All right. Question here: How long do you leave the ultra health lens to settle before you assess it? I'm leaving mine five to ten minutes. Um, you know, it really just depends on my clinic flow and how I'm doing. You're you're going to get an idea of how much vault you're seeing. And you just need to realize that it's going to settle 50 microns. And so after you fit 10 of these things, you're going to realize how much a 50 micron vault or a 100 micron vault difference is going to be. And you know, it's just like assessing gas permeable lenses. You know, as soon as you get good at assessing gas permeable lenses, you can tell off the bat you know, up to a half a diopter um, how steep or flat you need to be. And so, again, that just comes with experience. Right. Question here, how long does the, the lens actually last? These are six-month replacement lenses. There are doctors that change that modality, but I, I've been very successful with six-month modality. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you know, that, that, that's okay. also a patient management thing. Um, cost is a factor in anything we do, and at six months, it turns out to be economically feasible for the patient. <coughs> right. You know, you mentioned that you've gotten very comfortable with the lens before. So, sort of a, in a, in one or two sentences, bottom line, when would you actually choose the lens over a scleral in your practice? I use it as a first line before sclerals. Like I said, um, we it, we reserve our sclerals for advanced cases and cases that fail with other modalities. Um, you know, the real conversation is, you know, whether we try gas perm and gas perm piggyback versus hybrid. Um, it, you know, it, it's, not, it, it's not a good practice to talk about what people charge for this, but suffice it to say that, you know, scleral lens fees are three, four, five times the cost. And that just goes with the, the amount of chair time and the amount of uh, technical knowledge that it takes to fit them well. Right. Question here about the daily cleaners. You know, do you use one, and, and also what kind of solutions are best to use with Ultra Health? I use exclusively Clear Care with Ultra Health, um, but they are safe to store and to uh, clean throughout the day with any of the the, the newest generation um, multi-purpose solutions. And the, the, the newest generation is important because those were the ones that were actually built to work with silicone hydrogel. And they have good wetting agents in them as well. Great. <laughs> Question here, sort of particular to your own practice, what's the most common scleral size that you fit? Uh, most common, I'd say, is 18.2. Um, but, you know, in the 18 millimeter region, you know, we, we have a chance, uh, because we do a ton of it, to work with a bunch of different companies. And each company makes their own little, you know, spin on it. Some of them, you know, have 18.0 diameters. Some of them have 18.2. But, you know, if you're fitting sclerals, you know, the key is going to be to have a good range. So you need, at minimum, a 16.0 millimeter set, an 18.0 millimeter set, and a 20 millimeter set. 
uh, because you're going to find use for all those. Um, and they can be quite expensive. So just, you know, when you're, when you're ready to take the plunge into sclerals, go with two feet in. Right. So question here. We have a, someone who looks like a fan of custom hand grinding and polishing of the scleral haptic. Uh, is this something that you've done? Wow. You are a better man or woman than I. <laughs> um, I <laughs> do not have the time for that. Um, I, in one of my clinics, I'm typically seeing 15 patients in a half day, and this is with uh, complex corneas. So there is no way in this green earth that I have time to, to modify lenses. Right. Question here again about the Ultra Health. Um, does the hydrogel skirt uh, tighten with time? Um, you, you will get a tiny bit. Wait, wait, wait. Hydrogel or silicone hydrogel? Because Ultra silicone Health has hydrogel. silicone hydrogel, yeah. Uh, you will get a tiny bit. And that's, you know, when we talk about that edge fluting, um, you know, if you wait, immediately when you put the lens in, it will tighten up, you know, within five to ten minutes, which is why that's, you know, how long we, we typically wait to see these patients. And you'll get a little bit, but it's not to the point of where a hydrogel skirt will tighten for some reason. And I don't know the reason for that. Right. Practical question here. Uh, what lenses come with the trial sets for uh, Ultra Health? I'm going to punt that over to Louise Curcio, who is with the company, and I, I believe she's on the call. Louise, can you field that one? Certainly. I'd be happy to. So the uh, trial lens set comes with uh, lenses in the flat skirt from 50 to 550 volts. Um, it also comes with uh, lenses um, from 100 to 550 medium, and then it also has some steep lenses in it as well. It's a 26 lens set. Louise, do you want do you want to touch? Isn't there also for people that may not want to jump in with two feet on the Ultra Health right away? Isn't there like a, a modified smaller set that you can use? Is that? Yes. Yeah, so we're just uh, launching another set, which is really a subset of the of the main Ultra Health set. For people that are fitting mostly um, early to moderate keratocones, and essentially it's just the 50 to 250 volt lenses um, in the flat skirt. So if the patients that you're looking at are, as I said, they're um, emerging or moderate cones, then this is probably the set that you can start with. Uh, for people that are fitting more complex cases and have more more volume of and more complexities in the full set would be the way to go. But we do have options depending on the types of patients that you that you have. Great. Uh, question here, and this is again sort of particular to, to your practice, so you can feel free to <laughs> to answer or not. Um, this is more of a practice building question. So the question is, how how do you actually build a practice around complex contact lens cases? Uh, it seems that you know MDs typically take a lot of the cases. How did you do it, and how would you recommend the clinicians, you know, try to get their their feet wet in in doing this sort of thing? Well, if if you live in Nashville, I'll tell you it's impossible. Don't even try it. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> if if you're somewhere else, um, the thing to do is to hit the pavement. And you send a letter to every general ophthalmologist in the town. You send a letter to every optometrist in the town. You can say, hey, look, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working with these complex lenses, and I'm interested in seeing the stuff that you don't want to see. And so if any of these patients, and feel free to send me your hardest case, um, if any of these patients are, 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 are difficult and you want them fit well, send them to me, and you won't be disappointed. Um, then you get out and you go and you try to get a lunch with them and you try to talk to them about it and tell them what you're doing and tell them all the neat companies that you're working with. Um, and the most important thing is you treat the patients right. So if you're doing this to make money, um, you know that, that's the wrong motivation. If you're doing it to help patients that um, have few little options and need a true expert to help them, that's the reason to do this. You know, it, you make money from this stuff. It's not like you don't make money. But the point is your motivation needs to be to, to help the people that are essentially the most fragile. Um, and then 
the, the other way to do it is you, you've got to get educated. And you, if you're going to be the expert on this stuff, you've got to be the expert. And so you've got to go to every CE that you can hear of uh, on fitting irregular corneas. You've got to come out to Vegas uh, in January to the Global Lens Symposium, which is a whole meeting dedicated to irregular corneas. You've got to come to Academy and sit through um, all of the, the lectures by the diplomates about how to do this stuff. And you really just have to get involved. Um, you know, what you'll find is that it, it's a very tight-knit group of people within the academy who are doing work like this. And once you kind of make yourself known and you're, you know, you're interested in this stuff and you get to know these people, they will support you. And, you know, they, they will prop you up. And when you have a question, you ping them and, you know, you'll get three different answers. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing is just get involved. Great. A uh, question here, again, particular to your practice. You mentioned that you use the lenses for six months at a time. Do you actually re recommend that patients come in for a six-month checkup to see how, how the fit of the lens is doing? Uh, I don't. You know, is it wrong to do that? No. Um, do you need to do that? Probably not. Um, I, you know, I, it, it, I, I've created a, a, a system with my patients where essentially – you know, you start training patients. And right from the very get-go, you're, you know, what you're talking to them about is, hey, listen, you know, we are in a very fast-moving industry. You know, companies like Synergize are constantly coming out with newer and better things. And so when you come to see me, you can expect to be trying new stuff. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, fine. We'll go to the next best thing. But the, the, the training of your patients has to go with, listen, when you come to see me every year, we're going to be trying something new, and it's going to take some time. It's going to take some visits. But you can bet that I'm going to be putting you in the best possible thing that's out there on the market. Okay? Um, God, where was I going with that? I completely lost my train of thought. Adam, what was the question? Adam? Six months. <laughs> Oh, six months, right. So I've also trained my patients to, <laughs> I've also trained my patients to uh, email me whenever there's a problem. And so I am always mm. accessible by email. And so I get, you know, it, it, it's amazing. It's like, you know, we, we take VSP at our office, and VSP requires you to put um, a contact phone number on your answering machine. And so immediately when that, that rule came over, we're like, oh, my God, we're going to get calls at 1230 at night and on Sunday afternoons. And I'll tell you something, we get one phone call a year. People do not abuse this. If they're going to be emailing you, they're emailing you because they have a problem, right? And so these are the patients that you want to hear from. You know, the, the worst possible thing is that somebody has a problem and they don't tell you about it because then guess what? They're going somewhere else. Right. Uh, an interesting question here. How does the Ultra Health do with people with dry eyes? Okay, this is actually a really neat question. And um, I'll tell you what I've noticed. This lens does better for dry eye than really any other irregular cornea lens, except the scleral, obviously, that has um, a post-lens tear reservoir. But in terms of people with blepharitis, and I'm speaking mostly from my experience with the new Duet Progressive, which is going to be coming out, and just the Duet HD, which is for you know astigmatism. Patients with myeloma and gland dysfunction tend to do really well in this lens, and I think the reason is because of that post-lens tear reservoir that's created because of the vault, it's essentially just keeping tears adhered to the cornea. But the difference is that you get the tear pump, right? So just like any other contact lens, you get a pump of, of tears. It, the, the tears don't stay stagnant behind the ultra health lens or really any of the hybrid lenses, but they, it does keep a layer of tears adhered to the cornea. So, you know, is it doing anything to fix their myeloma and gland dysfunction? No. But it's acting almost like a bandaged contact lens against the eye. And so it's keeping the cornea um, wet. 
You know, hmm. that is going to be so an interesting idea. Some... Yeah, yeah, I, w w what I would love is for somebody to actually do a study on this um, because it, hmm. it needs to be done. Yeah, and this is actually sort of another question that people just asked also. I've gotten several people asking, does the lens actually do well for people who are post-LASIK? All right. Um, the answer to that is, in theory, yes. But what you'll find is that the ultra health set that's around is not made in flat enough base curves, right? But there's a fix for that, and that's coming down the pipeline. Um, it's not out on the market yet, but there is a new ultra health lens coming, and I maybe we don't even want to address when this is going to be launched, but I've started using this in my advanced cornea clinic um, where it's made specifically for post-surgical um, eyes. So it has a very flat uh, central base curve, and it still has that reverse geometry. So the answer is um, it's coming. Hmm. Good to know. And question here, and again, this is something that you probably have a great deal of experience with, can you speak about how insurance companies uh, work with Ultra Health and sort of do they cover it or the fitting fees or, or how does that work in your practice? You know, um, I'm really just getting into this because uh, where we are now, we, we don't ping insurance companies for it. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't have the greatest answer for that. Um, I know that you know, VSP and IMED, some of them cover some portion of this, but ask me in a year and I'll tell you. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I would sort of think that if the chair time is so much lower for this lens versus sclerals that they might actually be happy to pick up some of the tab. Let's see. And we're running out of time, but I'd like to actually get a couple more questions in here. <laughs> Philosophical question. Uh, question is, do I need to delve into scleral lenses for patients with irregular corneas, or do you think I could just get by using Ultra Health? I, I'll tell you, honestly, I think you can just get by with Ultra Health. Um, you know, I, there's going to be a very small percentage of, of failures with the lens, but if you're talking about, you know, the kind of practice where you're seeing the early to moderate stuff and even severe cones, you're going to just do just fine with ultra health. Now, you know, at some point you're going to develop, if you start seeing a bunch of those patients and enough to justify it, you're probably going to want to dip into sclerals too, but you're going to be fine with this lens. You know, I just had this conversation with a patient today. It's so much easier to fit than a scleral lens. And so that benefits not only the patient, but it benefits you too, because you're not pulling out your hair. Right. Um, so I guess then, I, since we're running out of time, I, I want to actually ask Louise a question if she's still there, um, because people are asking, how does one actually get started doing this with, with Ultra Health? How do you get, get on the road to using the lens? So uh, what you can do is if you go to Synergize.com, there, there are two things there. There's an interest form that you can fill out. And if you fill out the interest form and let us know when you're available, uh, we can have one of our um, regular cornea specialists contact you, either by phone or email. Or if you want to just jump straight to the training, there's actually an online webinar. It's about 15, 20 minutes that goes over the specifics of fitting. And once you fill that out and you fill out the interest form, then we can get you started. It's a fairly simple process. Very cool. All right, well, I guess we're running out of time. Jeff, did you have any sort of final words for us? Um, you know, I, I would just encourage everyone to give it a try. You know, if you're seeing these patients um, and you're still fitting them with gas perms and gas perm piggybacks and not using any of the more advanced stuff, um, you may want to think about it. I mean, it, it's just it's better for everyone involved. It's better for the, the doctor and it's much better for the patients, which is really why we're in this game. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming on out tonight. And, oh, by the way, this webinar will actually be archived on ODWire. If you've missed any of the finer points, you can come back and listen to it again. And we'll have a discussion thread running underneath the video. And if you have any more questions, I'm sure uh, you can get them answered there. So thanks again, everybody.